This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. People have often treated my gender like there's this truth behind it and I'm not telling it and they, they sort of re-roll the magic eight ball over and over when they keep getting answers that don't measure up. And they want to know what genitals I have and what sex I was assigned at birth and what my name used to be and they want the truth. But the truth is in all of the explaining why I was a man, I lost the plot. One day when I was asking to be called he, I realized I didn't really even think I was a man anymore because the absurdity of the struggle to be accepted had made gender feel more like a comedy than a fact. So I decided to retire from the gender binary altogether and change my pronoun to the gender neutral they. I'm out to dinner with my sweetheart. She's wearing a little black dress, a rhinestone bracelet. She looks beautiful. I'm in a shirt, tie, dress pants, jacket, and the waiter keeps mercilessly referring to both of us as ladies. Can I get you ladies the bill? Can I get you ladies some more coffee? Would you ladies, either of you ladies, like a dessert? And I, I'm obviously anything but a lady. And, and I realize that the English language is sadly devoid of names for people like me. And I try to cut the world some slack for this every day, all day, and the day after that too. But the truth is, is that every time I'm misgendered like this, I am reminded that I do not fit, that uh, I am not this, and I am not that, I am not seen, I can't be recognized, I have no name, I am invisible, and a tiny little sliver of me disappears. Just a tiny little sliver. Razored most days from the surface of my skin, but some days straight off of my soul. Sometimes it's felt deep or seen so sharply in focus. Other days just shrugged off. But still, all those slivers add up to something harder to pretend around. I can't control what people think about me, my body, and my gender. I can only ask for respect, and it's up to the individual to listen to me when I ask. In my gender retirement, I've given up putting that responsibility on myself. Instead, I try to be more devoted to listening to how other people want their identities to be respected. So many things get lost when we don't listen closely and try to give people what they need to feel seen. I like gender retirement. I imagine a pipe. Just like. It's like a bubble pipe. <laughs> Any gendered public washroom. Happened downstairs actually tonight, just before the uh, 15 minutes before the show. Any gendered public washroom, men's or women's, anywhere, any time at all, every day of my life, for the rest of my life. Possible danger. If there was a special bathroom just for me, I would get bored. I'd get soft. I'd lose my spidey senses, my, my cat-like reflexes, right? My, the eyes in my, the back of my head would close over forever, and I would miss them. I, I tell myself this some days, but most days, I don't believe me. And sometimes, I gotta admit, it kind of exhausts me, all the head shaking and stumbling around the two ring circus that is this gender binary, walking pronoun tight ropes and balancing between my safety and someone else's comfort. I am a gender failure. You are free to call me trans and I am proud to lift this name up and hold it right there in the sun. And you would not be wrong, but it still feels like I'm borrowing this word from someone else, but it's not all the way mine. And my friend who lent it to me might need it back or they might need it more than me. And really, these are all just words. And words are always imperfect. Words are just sounds we make with our mouths that point our minds to think of things that cannot be fully described in words anyway. I am a writer, so I know exactly 
where words fail us. And I know that a name is not a person. It is just what we have agreed to call them. And the thing about rarely being seen, the thing about being something else, something other, something not this box, not quite that box either, the thing about always being called words that bounce off of me or fall flaccid, flat at my feet, is what a heart balm it is when she looks right at me like she does. How she heals me with that sideways flicker in her eyes look that you just wait until I get you home, look, yeah? How her hands on me helped help me own all of this body again, her hands on me, how she takes me, takes what she wants and then gives it back to me when she is finished, gives it back to me better somehow, more whole and all the sweeter because it took so long for me to find myself, to truly live inside all of me. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 36. We're here with Ivan Coyote and Ray Spoon and Clyde Peterson from Gender Failure. And we just finished the opening night for the Seattle Transgender Film Festival called Translations. Welcome to Ray, Ivan, and Clyde. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Welcome. So we usually start our interviews with having our guests identify sort of your self-identification around your gender or however you identify across multiple identities, your positionality, so that our listeners have an idea of where folks are coming from and starting from in terms of narratives and conversation. So whatever you want to tell us. My name's Ivan and I'm a Yukoner and an author a performer. I identify as a trans butch. I'm a female assigned at birth and I drive a truck. My name is Ray Spoon. I don't know how to drive, which means I'll never become an adult where I grew up in the prairies. I identify as gender retired. I go by the pronoun they. I'm also a musician and an author and that's all. My name is Clyde Peterson, and I live in Seattle, and I'm an animator, and I go by he or they or dude or bro, and I also drive a truck, <laughs> and it's small, but it's sufficient. For listeners out there who obviously didn't get to see the show tonight, can you tell us a little bit about Gender Failure, some events or shows you have been excited to do or are coming up, and how long you'll be touring for? Gender Failure is like a multimedia show made up of stories, music, and animations. And we have been touring it without the visuals for about a year, but the visuals have come in since last spring. And our most recent show, we did this in London last and then New York. Regina. And Regina. Regina. Oh yeah, it's not a joke. It's a town in Canada. Um, uh, Ray and I, I guess we started collaborating, I think in 2006 and we did a show called You Are Here, which was kind of like a family uh, history show of uh, my family history and Ray scored it with music and Ray at the time was playing music and not doing any text. And then we uh, decided that we wanted to do like a very queer and trans located work together and when we got together last April of 2012 Ray started pushing me to do more music and I wanted Ray to do more text so we kind of pushed each other outside of our comfort zones and we premiered 45 minutes of that show at a little theater called Dixon Place in Manhattan and Clyde saw us there. Wait, I have another thing. Oh Ray has a thing. <laughs> The reason why we met Clyde is because we did You Are Here and Clyde's dad Art saw us. And Clyde's dad Art was our fan first and then that's how Clyde knew who we were. So that's just all. That other show led into Clyde and then Clyde... That's I knew about you. I knew about you because yeah. I was drunk. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how show business works. But um, <laughs> someone's dad sees you and you become friends. Okay. And then... And yeah, so then... Clyde saw us do 45 minutes of gender failure of the first incarnation and then wrote in his journal really cute and showed us this in London as his like 
goals for the year, like visualizations. <laughs> he wanted to do visuals with Ray and Ivan. So that happened. The lesson here is write it in your journal. So before that, I had seen a really spectacular video show. I'll just talk about video for a second. I got to go see Sufjan Stevens play at the Paramount in Seattle, and he had with him an amazing animator from New York who's this killer lady animator, and I was like, what? They had like seven screens and four projectors, and I was like, I want to do that. So I'm learning how to VJ through gender failure. So that was kind of my track towards gender failure, and then saw the show in New York and was really excited. But I'd always been a fan of Ivan from seeing them read throughout my drunken college years. So it's true, there's a video of it. I saw you at the Butch Voices Regional Conference down in Portland and was, yeah. So Clyde, being a Seattleite, I've seen some of your work recently, most recently at the Sister Spit touring show. Do you want to talk a little bit about your other work, sort of what you're up to these days? And I really liked the visuals with the show. I almost couldn't imagine it without them. It looked really good and really highlighted you guys nicely. Sure. I have a couple of projects going on this year. I have a TV show called Boating with Clyde, and I take musicians on my boat, which is a dinghy that I built, and it's eight feet long. It's called Clyde Jr., and it's pink. I tried to paint it fire truck red, but it turned out ladybug pink. And they perform on my boat, and then I edit it, and it's like the Muppets, but gay. So that's on the internet. You can watch it at boatingwithclyde.com. I'm starting to shoot the third season this year, so it's pretty exciting. There's puppet shows, gay puppets, gay fish, newscasters. One is named Pinky Bottom Feeder. <laughs> he is paired with a grumpy anchor man named Old Salt who had a gay relationship in the 70s and is now a curmudgeon. That's mostly what I'm up to. I have a Boating with Clyde art installation at Fort Culture in September. It's my first solo exhibition in a long time. And I'm working on gender failure. It's like a continuing project. And I work at Real Girls, which is awesome. I teach young women ages 9 to 19 how to make movies. Also, non-gender conforming youth go there, which is sweet. I just wanted to add one more thing about the show. We've had some new media for this piece called Who Do You Think You're Fooling? And I'm super excited about it because I've been just like researching trans history. And it's pretty interesting to research trans history for this show because you want to find gender failures. Mm. And I've been like looking for the people who failed throughout history. And it's been so inspiring. Like post on the internet and I'm like, okay, tell me your favorite trans heroes. And people... They really are telling me a lot of successes. A lot of people who really have crossed over, who really have made it big being RuPaul and all these people. And I'm like, actually, I just want to know. A hot gender mess. Yeah, just give it to me like that. So that is like something I'm very excited about, about gender failures. Like I've learned a lot about the history of our community in the last month, just researching this piece and it's been cool. Great. Thanks, Clyde. This next question is for Ray and Ivan. So your performance is really personal, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how it is to sort of put your personal stories out there on stage night after night as you perform and sort of what that's like for you and how you feel about that. My work has been intensely personal for, well, my 10th book, which is actually called Gender Failure, which I'm co-authoring with Ray. And some of Clyde's visuals are going to be in there as well. So, you know, it's been, I guess, close to two decades now of doing intensely personal work and putting it out there. And it still feels risky to me. And there used to be things that I wouldn't talk about. There still are many things I won't talk about. But a lot of the things in Gender Failure, this particular show, were things that I had at one point said I'll never speak about in public. I don't want to have my top surgery, for instance. When I made the decision that that's what I was going to do and I was going to proceed forward with that, I remember saying to my partner, Zina, at the time, I'm not writing about this. It's not for public consumption and it's not for public discourse and I don't have any interest in dialoguing or arguing or justifying myself and my choices around my body like that. And then I quit writing a column at Extra West, which meant that I quit having my work immediately commented on anonymously online and that was in incredibly freeing for me somehow 
that I didn't have to deal with internet trolls in that way. People who didn't even have the ovaries to assign their real name to things. And that really freed me up in a, in a really huge way. And I realized that I felt like it was important to document and to share this ongoing story. And I think that's one of the things that resonates with people is that we're talking about real things and our real selves. And we're there physically doing that. And that's one of the sources of power of the material. But there's still times where I'm like, I can't believe I'm about to say this here with that person there. And, you know, because I don't have any control over who walks through the door. But it's been a constant breaking down of my own assumptions about how people are going to handle the material. I had a nice little old lady came up to me tonight and was like, it really resonated with me. I don't know what or why or how or what parts, but I wouldn't have thought looking at her that she would have found some reference to her own struggle with her body and the work, but she did. So it's a good learning experience for me. Yeah, I just played music for years. So music is like a really different format. You just like play your song and then you don't talk a lot. <laughs> well, I talked a lot, but you don't have to say anything like truthful really or like you don't actually like do a narrative or whatever. So <laughs> what happened for me is like actually the way I started writing was um, the National Film Board is making a musical documentary about my childhood. And so I was like, oh no. And then they tried to just fire questions at me and I was like, oh my God, my childhood is a minefield. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to write 10 stories and... Anyway, so that's kind of how I got started. I was just like found the 10 most like wrenching things. Like, I was just like trying to map it out, you know, so and then it ended up turning into a book. And, and so, yeah, but then with this, all of that was kind of happening all at the same time. And it was Ivan who kind of encouraged me to read the stories on stage, which for me is like, you know, at the beginning of making something, you don't imagine even doing that. Like you can't imagine doing it when you're writing it because I wouldn't have written it. And I remember even in the first shows, I was like almost weeping on stage which I've now calmed down a bit or like really freaked out. And, and that was like a really different experience. Reading is really different from playing music for me anyway, because music, there's just like, you're doing a lot. All your hands are busy. Like you're not thinking a lot. And so yeah, it's been quite a process, but like really interesting how that's changed. How I relate to the audiences that I perform for, like how personal it is. It's actually ended up giving back a lot. You know, you feel like you're putting yourself out there and it encourages other people to kind of tell you their stories and relate to you. And so it actually made me feel less lonely. <laughs> then more vulnerable and weird so that's good anyway yeah so that's how I feel about it <laughs> so this one is for Ray so being a fellow they them gender neutral pronoun person trying to navigate the binary as well I know that you just put out a response to the Toronto Star article that was out about you and then responded to it on your tumblr I guess the they and them pronouns just sort of made them explode or their word processor explode or something like that. So do you want to talk a little bit about what happened and sort of your response around that? Well, basically I went by the he pronoun for about 10 years, 11 years or something like that, like in public. And I was going by they in my private life for a while. In Montreal, it was like a very common pronoun and there's a lot of support. So the thing I found out about coming out of the, as the day, I did that my last album came out and I usually do interviews in a lot of the weeklies kind of entertainment papers, a lot of the mainstream papers in Canada when I tour. The thing I kind of felt like was because it was like 11 years later, there was a very big change in climate between when I came out as he. So I actually found it easier, <laughs> maybe just because of the time and because of the internet and stuff like that. So the Toronto Star piece, it was a very interesting mix. It's basically like a, a psychological knot that I can't completely <laughs> unravel and Ivan was also involved. But yeah, basically my response was about just making sure certain people weren't written out. They chose mostly white people to speak to. Uh, I'm not sure of everybody's ethnicity. Basically, it just they focused on like, white transmasculine people and, and wrote out people like Alicia Lim, who were like a big part of the story with what happened with that extra earlier on. So I think the thing, when you deal with journalists from mainstream papers, you're like, okay, they're always like, I'm going to use your pronoun. And you're like, yeah. And then you're like, you know what? Just check with your editor. And they're like, no, nah, I'm going to use it. It's a sort of back and forth that always happens. And then inevitably it always isn't very often it's not used i think you know i choose not to argue about the grammar validity of the they pronoun because i don't care there are many pronouns that don't have necessarily the same like history and i don't really care like i'll try to call anyone any pronoun they want and i just when i speak with the mainstream media try to accentuate how it's just like why not try to make people feel comfortable which is my feeling about it so with the toronto star it was kind of a shocking thing i was djing and i slept for four hours and i woke up and hey you're on the cover of the toronto star and yeah. Anyway, Ivan could probably speak more about it. 
Well, can we say what happened? Yeah. What was the exact quote? Okay. Well, I mean, basically, I didn't answer the person, first of all, when I got the email. I use the they pronoun. That's a recent thing for me. I use he sometimes. When I go into public high schools, I still use she. And sometimes when I deal with the mainstream media, I use she because I would rather talk about that my 10th book is coming out. Now I have four films out and three CDs and I've been a touring artist in Canada for 20 years and you know, and the work I do in schools, I would rather talk about that than have a discussion like this about what pronoun I prefer or don't prefer and then have them inevitably, indubitably fuck it up. And so I didn't get back to them. And then she wrote me again and said, I've talked to Ray and I spoke with Bear, two trusted beloved friends of mine so I talked to her and I couldn't have made it any clearer that I didn't want her to ever paraphrase any kind of descriptions of not only myself, but any of the people in the, how important language was and how it was paramount, fundamental, foundational to the whole discussion. And that she wasn't doing anyone a big, huge favor to call them by the pronoun that they felt respected and seen by, that it was a given for me. And she assured me up and down that it was going to be fine and wrote me afterwards and said how nice it was and how I really helped her understand it. Because at one point she asked me if, if I had had any surgeries uh -huh. and I said, yeah, I, uh, I had a ingrown toenail removed once when I was nine. I, at one time I broke my wrist and they had to reset it, break it. I don't know if that's a surgery as much as a procedure. And she was like, you know, no, I meant surgeries. And I went, oh, you want to speak to me about my genitalia? Is that what you want to talk about? Why don't you just come out and say what you want to talk about? And then she confessed to me that she'd been asked by her editor one time to ask a woman if she had had breast reduction surgery or breast augmentation surgery, and she refused. And I was like, oh, yeah, so why won't you refuse with me? Why is it somehow less rude all of a sudden? And she actually, I felt like she got it. So in the print, they didn't fuck up raise pronoun. On the online version, I believe, can I say it? Yeah. I think this caption was something like Ray Spoon. She prefers, she the, pronoun prefers the pronoun they. <laughs> it was just like, I clicked on the link. I was in a hotel room in Ottawa and I clicked on the link and I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I texted the reporter right away and I was like, please tell me that you didn't do that. Please tell me some editor fucked it up, right? And she wrote me back and said, yeah, it was a, you know, a valuable learning experience for me that I have to keep track of, like, not just the print, but blah, blah, something, what a rot one, wink a whack a whack, whatever she said, <laughs> caption editors, yeah. And, uh, and I was like, oh yeah, so Ray gets basically misgendered mm -hmm. and humiliated in a massive, <laughs> huge public way. And you had a valuable learning experience. How sickening. And then I haven't heard back from her. <laughs> so you mean it's not all that much better in Canada? <laughs> also, I would just like to say that the whole grammatically correct thing is totally bogus and it's a useless argument. First of all, Google didn't exist as a verb until a few years ago. Language is constantly changing and fluctuating to adapt to popular culture. It happens all the time. Second of all, there is documented use as they, as a singular pronoun that goes all the way back to the 16th century, Chaucer used it. So if it's fucking good enough for Chaucer, then Toronto Star can get on board. Anyway. We'll repost that link. We have a motivated grammar link that takes it back to Shakespearean time. <laughs> I really appreciate what you said because I definitely think it should be more about the work and not sensationalizing and monstrositizing our bodies and I think that's why it's so critical that we have alternative media outlets and that's one thing that we've really strived for and when we talk to folks on the podcast whether they're trans or not that that's something that is very important to us and I'm really glad that you talked about it being like privileging white folks and trans masculine folks because I think that's often what happens with mainstream media who winds up on TV I mean the media here is just such an arm of capitalism and all the gross things anyway I think you have the next question Sean Okay, so next question, Ivan, is for you, and I first kind of learned about your work through, I had a friend link me to the YouTube performance where you're doing the, to all the beautiful, kick-ass, fierce, and full-bodied femmes out there, especially as someone that was butch identified for a long, long time, and really navigating those spaces and having my female partners and or friends ally with me in bathroom spaces, and that particular piece really resonated with me about how I move through this world. 
one of the things I thought about when I knew we were going to be talking to you folks was how hard with the kind of ever-changing evolution of gender politics and discussions, how difficult it is to go on record. Like we talk about a lot with this podcast, like my gender journey is documented. How I thought about myself and my gender and what's happening around me two years ago has changed over this time, but I'm kind of always on record having to own that, right? And I have to embody that everywhere in kind of this evolving gender conundrum that we all kind of navigate both personally and with our community around us. Does it feel difficult to kind of embody all of those years of gender exploration and dialogue, especially when political agendas and social movements kind of change over time. Like, how does that feel for you? Especially you had said earlier that they was new, you know, like this is kind of a new thing. How does that work while you guys do your art and as these things change over time? <laughs> for now. Well, we've, we've retired from the gender binary. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I think about, but I, I can't let it paralyze me creatively. Otherwise, I feel like I could talk myself into a blank page really easily if I feel like, you know, this is where I'm at and this is where I always have to be at or, you know, and I mean, there's things that I wrote not very long ago that I definitely wouldn't phrase that way or I might have brought out a different nuance. And I guess part of it is just kind of putting the work out there and then just letting it go. Ultimately, I can't really control how someone is going to imbibe my words anyway. They're going to always filter it through their own isms and their own experience and it's going to resonate with them in different ways. I mean, I've done shows and had someone come up and say that thank you for, you know, talking about a butch woman's experience. And I don't identify as a butch woman. I identify as a butch person. But what has happened in that moment is that they've felt recognized somehow. So I let the language slide because it's not about saying I'm different than you. It's about a politic of inclusion for me. The same show, someone will come up and say, you know, I really like that you're talking about being a trans guy. And I wouldn't actually say trans guy either. I would say trans person. But again, I'm not going to correct their language because part of my job is to make things that people can pull parts of it from and reflect themselves. What I love is when people come up and say, I really love your work because you're from a small town like me. That's what I really love. I love those moments where it's like, it's not even about trans or queer politics or they or pronouns. It's about like still having a connection with your family or, or some other thing that resonates with them. So I really just put the work out. I try to be careful. I try to not step on anyone else's business while I'm trying to explain mine. I don't know if I do that 100% of the time. Probably, actually, no, I don't. I mean, no, nobody, you can't. And then I just think about my grand. Sometimes she would say, uh, stick your head out of the crowd and you're bound to get shot at. <laughs> so I think, you know, ultimately putting your work out there is making a part of public discourse. And yeah, there's probably things, I mean, even in the Butch Roadmap, there's things that I wouldn't necessarily say in that piece I only wrote a few years ago. I would probably soften things up no pun intended. I just feel like the edges are a lot more blurry for me now than they even were. And I have no desire to police anyone else's gender. And not that I was in that piece. I was trying to like describe myself, right? But I don't want the reader to think there's any one right way to be a butch either. You know what I mean? So basically a big, long question, <laughs> non-answer of your question. And I also like how you were talking about on stage, are you trans enough? Or not trans enough and I think that kind of relates and I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with a lot of trans folks struggle with I just wanted to ask a question sort of about geographics one thing that we've noticed with the podcast we sort of have this bi-coastal privilege thing we see a lot of things that happen out here on the west coast Seattle San Francisco even Portland and similar stuff may be happening on the east coast but in a different way but we have a ton of listeners like in Texas and Utah that don't have access to probably a more politicized queer and trans community but even just more people more population happening. So you guys touring around and where have been some of your favorite places to go and places where you've had unexpected amazingness happen or just maybe a story you want to tell about being on the road and how it's been different in different spots? I haven't toured that much with gender failure, but I have toured a lot. Mm -hmm. And I guess my response to that question, which comes up kind of often from people on living in bi-coastal zones is, 
I respond in a way that says, oh no, someone's talking about how liberal the coasts are and how... I respond... I know, you asked the question very well. <laughs> but I think the idea that a lot of people will pull from that is that idea that the coasts are liberal and the middle is corn or something, but I really would disagree with that. I've toured a lot with Kimia Dawson in the middle of the country. I did like five tours two years ago in the middle of the country, just from Detroit to Athens, Georgia, and and I find that people are just as compassionate and smart and educated in those places, not necessarily about the same thing. I feel like the coastal regions are spoiled and privileged. <laughs> I don't like saying that word, but I'll say it. Fine. So I like tense up a little bit at that question. It's kind of like when someone who tours a lot and is from the Northwest is at a show and they say, well, we went on tour in Alabama and let me just tell you a story. I get real tense at that very moment and I think I should probably leave the room right now because I really don't want to hear a story like that. Ray, would you like to add a different context to this? Um, Speaking towards gender failure or something? Well, Canada has three coasts. Let's not forget the Arctic Ocean. We've been almost there. Anyway, tri-coastal. But, like, I've only met a few trans people up north. Of but anyway, sometimes Ivan sends people, like, I'm the only trans person in town. I'm going to hang out with you because I'm friends with Ivan. And you're, like, in Yellowknife. You're like, yay! And then they take you to a Hi, secret Marcus. desert. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Marcus, what's up? How's Yellowknife? Thanks for taking me to the secret desert. So, yeah, I don't know. I grew up in, like, in a town that's, like, in the middle of Canada and... I basically came out as transgender and I, was, I started making country music on the same day. I don't understand. And I played every small town, like so many small towns in Canada, because you have to. You just have to pay for the gas, so you just get on stage and then everybody looks at you and there's a moment and then you start singing and hopefully <laughs> the country music keeps everything calm, which was mostly my experience. But yeah, I think I found with that experience, like what the line in your story, like gay does not mean cool, you know, like 10 years ago. It was not as accepted to be trans at all. Uh, ten years ago, it was a different kind of climate within like lesbian gay communities for trans people. And what I found is I stopped feeling safer in like gay spaces than in like a non-gay queer whatever space because I found the numbers were the same of who would like just listen to me and use my pronoun. Like I could be in a small small town and you could just meet someone. Who'd... There's some people who they just see something they've never seen before and they go, oh, and then they just respect it. But it doesn't matter necessarily the background the numbers are always kind of so I just started calling it squares and not squares that's how I think about it so anyway and being from you know a, kind of like more near rural places in Canada I find like I would have lost myself if I left that behind and only stayed on the coasts or in the big cities because part of who I am is you know that my uncles are all welders and you know like my cousin JC wouldn't have seen me play if I hadn't played in Red Deer a bunch of times so anyway I just think you, you don't have to lose part of your identity to be trans it's interesting and and I found that over the years, I was kind of forced myself into like smaller towns and into the middle and all over. So, yeah. So I just kind of like stopped thinking it as like liberal spaces are safe. I think all three of us feel a little uncomfortable that hasn't been stated is part of that argument about everyone in a big city is liberal and everyone from the Midwest or the prairies in Canada is somehow like more conservative or more redneck or less educated is really classist for me. I'm from a blue collar family up north in the Yukon, north of British Columbia, which is north of Seattle. So basically Seattle is the south for me. And one of the things that I really appreciate about my blue collar family, I just got a letter from my grandma with a clipping in it about a couple dealing with one of the partners in the couple transitioning. And she was like, I thought of you and Zena, and I thought you might enjoy this. And to just paint an entire part of a country and say that they all think like that there is a big ism right there. I'm not party to, I don't see it that way. I also feel as queer artists, like I'm going next week on a tour of tiny little pulp mill towns all through the interior of British Columbia. And they've asked me to come there and do anti-bullying work in their schools, right? I think that that's a really fantastic thing and I'll go there. I don't find it any more terrifying, except for sometimes motel parking lots. But other than that, you, you know. know how to drive, though. I can't go anywhere. I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry. So I think that's a big part of it. Oh, you want to talk about my grandma?
Yeah. So like Grandma Pat is cool. I met her a couple times. Basically, we got back from this show at Outside Whitehorse and I was taking my shoes off. Let's face it, everyone's scared of their own grandma. You know, you're scared to be like, guess what? I'm trans. Like, that's like the hardest person to be like, so sometimes anyway, for me, I found and I was like, I came in and I didn't have my shoes off and she said, are you a he or a she? Because she'd been reading the paper and we had an interview. And I said, what do you want me to be? Because <laughs> I was freaking out. Anyway, but she was being really cool about it. So I don't know. It's interesting because she's really, really smart. She reads a lot. She just read it, synthesized the information and was like actually just trying to be respectful, even though it terrified me at the time. But yeah, she's 94. Yeah, she's 94. So it's really interesting that that's where you went with it and that it raised that for you. And I'm really glad that you spoke to the things that you did. And Clyde, kind of what you were saying about just by saying that we're othering sort of the rest of the country, because I feel like it's surprising where we do find allies and where we do find people that accept us. And oftentimes it's not in the LNG or the broader gay community, kind of like what you were saying, Ray. But I appreciate you talking about the class part of that. So the one thing I did want to bring up, because it's something we talk about off mic and on mic a lot, and you kind of spoke to you a little bit during the show is, am I trans enough? And am I still part of the sisterhood? You know, in the sense of having a, a history that's rooted with one community and using different pronouns or identifying in a different way or taking medical steps for some folks, like how you then don't belong to either. And you're always kind of navigating those spaces and trying to either prove that you're worthy or find that shared history and try to like really claim it. It's, I think it's something really difficult. So especially with being out in the media and like navigating all of that, have you seen your audiences change and, or have you had different conversations or different struggles with things as they kind of come to all of you? I guess like what you're saying, some of the worst things came to you from inside the community. Like I would say some of the worst things I've ever heard said to me were by trans people, <laughs> you know, and I think it's maybe because I tour, so I travel and then people are trying to relate to you. But sort of being like, well, it's good you go by that pronoun because, you know, you don't, you know, you haven't done anything to look more like a man or, or that kind of stuff. You know, people that I kind of like sort of supported through their transitions coming back like years later and being like, are you still a man? And I'm like, yep, <laughs> still hanging in there. I don't know. Or at the time I was. So that's kind of what brought me to retiring was making a statement. My retirement from gender was more of a statement within the trans community to be like, I'm not trying to be a man. And, you know, like that that's not my goal and that I just don't feel the need to be gender myself and I'm happy to respect everyone else's gender and you know whatever decisions anyone makes for themselves and but yeah that's my feeling on that part of it so I think the same thing applies where I was like you're not necessarily safe in any area and it seems to me like with gender neutral pronouns or stuff like that like I almost felt like I was waiting till it was okay for me even being trans like within the community until and then a couple of years ago I was like oh this is getting pretty roomy for me. <laughs> when I started having a good time, I was like, sweet. Anyway, so, you know, hopefully it can keep moving that way for a lot of people. I think Ray came out as he at a time in their career, now they, where I think that that really hurt Ray's capacity to build an audience. We've talked about this. We've talked about negotiating that. I, I made a conscious choice to keep on using she in my public life because I didn't want it to be a focus of my work and because I knew that it would cost me in ways that I wasn't ready to pay yet. There was still a lot in the lesbian and like women's community. There was, I think, a lot of judgment around that and I saw it really hurt Ray's audience. I think it's a testament to the fantastic artist and human and creative soul that Ray is, that Ray has been so successful when having to fight transphobia within the queer community in such a really intense way, just when Ray was starting to really bust out. Like I really saw that happen as Ray's friend and as Ray's collaborator. It was hard to watch. Yeah. And I think there is more space now, definitely. And I think we owe a lot of that to our artists who are constantly kind of eking out these new spaces, right? But on the upside of that, <laughs> well, it's true actually, when I came out as he, like I would have a crowd, like you could cut that into 10% actually, like it like really cut it, you know, but I don't regret it. I think the nice thing is it actually plays into capitalism too, where I'm just like, all right, now I'm free. <laughs> I felt like I was just like, I was already trans. So I could just like, I was just drunk on freedom. And I was like, wow, I'm going to be a country singer. Now I'm going to move to Berlin. Now I'm going to make electronic. I was just like, I could just do whatever I wanted really. And so that I've been having a lot of fun too. 
you have anything to say that, Claude? I really love it when you say that you were drunk on freedom. <laughs> I've seen you say that twice in my life, and it always inspires me. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can answer this question in the right way or something. I feel like I've definitely had some of the hardest times in navigating changing genders and like developing that with people I've been very close to or dates and not so much with audiences. I can relate a lot to what Ivan was talking about, about like not correcting people after a show, just letting them read whatever they need to read to go home with a, like a new found sense of they're not alone because I like personally don't care how people identify me. I won't correct people. I don't want to spend the energy on it. I don't really care. That's kind of like where I stand at. I had like this experience with a date like six or seven years ago that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with. She was like, okay, a queer person. Like, so you're, hopefully you're trained to be a good queer ally to trans people, but not really. And she was like, you like, don't stand up for yourself. You don't like tell people and I was just like, it's not my job to tell people all the time that I'm trans. Like, I could come out all day long to you. And then, so like, she was like outing me to people and I was just like, you're being a bad ally. It's not your job either. So I thought that that was like a pretty big growing experience for me for someone who I was really close to at the time. But yeah, I can identify with everything everyone else has said here today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm drunk on freedom. <laughs> we totally appreciate all of your time and we'll link to all of your work. And Ray, you've sung me on the bus to work many a mornings and I adore your work. And Ivan, you're amazing. And Clyde, you're amazing. And whatever you want us to put up, we'll link to. And if there's any final words or anything coming up that you want folks to know about that are following you, I'm sure people that are going to be tuning into this are probably going to be people that are already fans of you. And then maybe some people just discovering you for the first time. Boating with Clyde oh, boating with is, is the future online. Boatingwithclyde.com is where you'll find me. It's actually my future. I'm getting in that boat soon. I'm overcoming my fear of water. It's coming up. So for me, I have an album coming out in August, and the National Film Board like, it made a documentary about me that's coming out in September called My Prairie Home. And it is an uplifting documentary about growing up trans in a Pentecostal family in Calgary, Alberta. And the album is a soundtrack to that. And so also, the next book that I'm writing, is that the next book you're writing too? Yeah. We're writing a book called Gender Failure and Clyde's putting visual art in it. So that's like the big thing coming out. And Gender Failure is just kind of like going around. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to Canada, we might go to Northern Ireland, I don't know. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, Gender Failure, the book will be out with Arsenal Pulp Press in April, I think, of 2014. And I think we're going to release it with the download of the live show. And we're currently working on a project called the Tomboy Survival Guide, which is like a how-to manual for tomboys aged um, 3 to 103, mm -hmm. or 4, or 5. <laughs> and I'm writing a novel called Girls Who Love Horses. Awesome. So we'll provide links to that. And stay tuned for you folks listening out there for all of that awesome work coming out. Again, really appreciative of, it's been a long day. I know you, some of you have some more hours ahead of you. So I really, really appreciate you taking some time to uh, sit down with us. Much appreciated. Yes. Boating, boating, boating with Clyde. Boating, boating, boating with Clyde. Everything is looking good Boating with Clyde Everything is looking good In the summer Everything is looking good In the summer Everything is looking good In the summer Boating with Clyde First things first Pensacola, Florida, 2004. I was living by the bayou and eating from the dumpster until I met these freaky dudes, Evan and Dave. They said, listen up, we floated a long, long way from the mini St. Paul, you know, the Twin Cities. We took the big old Mississippi and its tributaries. Now we're living on an island a few blocks from your house. We got some guns and some dogs. Come and chill out. Everything is looking good.
Building this boat, drinking beers in the backyard, playing like it's gonna float. Plywood, power tool, nail in the tack, bend the wood in the jig and fiberglass. Six years later, this thing still floats. We're explorers of the brackish waters of the West Coast, my hometown, Seattle. I'm seeing it with new eyes. Sunny hell yeah, let's go boating with Clyde. Everything is looking good in the summer. Everything is looking. Welcome to episode 37 check ins. This is the performance series two, following up to the gender failure performance by Ray Spoon and Ivan Coyote and animation by Clyde Peterson. Again, just a huge big thank you to these three individuals for sitting with Gendercast after their show late at night of opening night of the Translations Film Festival. And special thank you to Translations Film Festival and the new Translations Festival director, Sam Berliner, for helping us get the interview set up and getting it to where Gendercast could sit down with Ray, Ivan, and Clyde while they were here in Seattle. Just a couple check-ins. Summertime is ramping up and Gendercast is definitely busy. As many of you saw, Sean just wrapped up his master's MSW research project and he sounds like he got a lot of responses. So thank you to all of you who responded. And that's just super fantastic. For some of you that are local to the Seattle area, I just wanted to give a shout out to the petition that's going around called Queers United for Ending Violence, which is a petition in opposition to a group in Seattle called Social Outreach Seattle asking for increased police presence up on Capitol Hill, which is the queer neighborhood in Seattle, um, in response to some recent violent crimes and co-opting the rainbow flag and putting the Seattle Police Department emblem on it. I'm going to go ahead and just read the petition because I think that'll give all the context that you'll need to kind of understand what, what it is that it's all about. Dear Social Outreach Seattle and broader LGBT community, we acknowledge that responding to violence in our community is important and working together to create solutions for our collective safety is critical. It is with compassion and holding space for those harmed that we speak out against the call for an increased police presence on Capitol Hill. The Capitol Hill anti-crime violence march and rally held on March 22, 2013 suggests that recent violence on Capitol Hill is being perpetuated by neighborhood outsiders and quote unquote criminals who are attacking quote members of our community unquote. This framing of violence fails to acknowledge the many forms of violence experienced by LGBTQ people, most critically, the violence perpetuated by the police department and the criminal justice system. It is dangerous to ask to, to remove quote criminals from Capitol Hill because many LGBTQ people are seen by police as those very same criminals. Let's be clear. This event was a call to action co-signed by the police department that is now being used by the city as a quote community mandate for increased police presence, e.g. the mayor's announcement of the park ranger program for Cal Anderson one day following the march and rally, which reroutes public funds from parks and recreation programming to this expansion of the Seattle Police Department's anti-crime team. The police have demonstrated that they will enforce this community mandate with disparate results towards queer people of color, trans asterisk people, queer youth, sex workers, those without proper papers or identification, homeless queer people, people with disabilities, people with mental health challenges, people under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and the poor. This will result in many queer people facing even more violence, harassment, surveillance, arrest, and imprisonment. The Seattle Police Department has been found in violation of the civil rights of people of color through violence, excessive force, profiling, and retaliation. In its July 27, 2012 decree, the Department of Justice found that Seattle Police Department has engaged in a pattern or practice of excessive force that violates the Constitution and federal law. There's a link to that report in the petition. In addition, the report signed by the Department of Justice, President Obama, and the City of Seattle emphasized that their findings, quote, raise serious concerns that some Seattle Police Department policies and practices, particularly those related to pedestrian encounters, could result in discriminatory policing. It is with this report in mind, as well as the many personal stories and experience of members of our community, that we know that more police presence will lead to more of these pedestrian encounters and therefore more discriminatory force and violence directed at our community by the Seattle Police Department. 
In many of Seattle's queer and trans communities, police are widely known to engage in arbitrary profiling, intimidation, and unchecked violence, including physical and sexual assault, particularly of trans women, queer youth, sex workers, people who are homeless, and other marginalized LGBT people. This has resulted in many queer and trans people fearing simply walking on the streets where police are known to patrol. Nearly one in six transgender people, including 21% of transgender women, have been incarcerated at some point in their lives, far higher than the rate of the general population. Among black transgender people, nearly half have been incarcerated at some point. We believe asking for more police presence will only lead to many queer and trans community members, particularly poor people of color and poor people, to face even more violence, harassment, and arrest. We demand a change in tactics, imaging, and direction to respond to the recent and ongoing forms of violence experienced by our community's friends and loved ones. We object to the false LGBT branding of the rainbow and quote safe space stickers with the Seattle Police Department emblems. This is indeed extending the reach of the prison industrial complex in our city, in our community, in our neighborhoods. This is not the liberation the rainbow once meant to us. Signed, Queers United for Ending Violence. And that's what the petition says. We'll post a link to the petition and to the Facebook page. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was the Trans Health, the Philly Trans Health Conference coming up. The conference starts next Thursday on June 13th and goes through Saturday, June 15th. And I'll be co-presenting on Thursday, June 13th, workshop with Axel Creekio at 4.05 p.m. on June 13th called the multiple blank of trans parens identity and i'll post a link to our workshop presentation and then in addition to the workshop presentation gendercast is super excited to have a table at the philly trans health conference and our intern our lead intern gilligan will be hanging out at the table and um, several of us will be uh, working with him we're hoping to maybe get a couple mini interviews on site at the conference so if you're going to be at the conference We'd love to have a you know couple minutes with you just to hear about what you're thinking about the conference or talk about what kind of cool work you're doing, where you come from. I know last time I was at the conference, Sean and I met folks from all over the country. So it was really great to meet people from Kentucky and Tennessee and just see the really amazing work being done all over. I'm also going to post a uh, link to our website blog post that talks about if you have a little bit of time at the conference and you want to hang out and table with us we'd love to have you so there's some signups guilt you just shoot Gilligan an email and um, he'll take it from there I also wanted to give a shout out to one final thing that happened here in Washington State that hopefully is happening nationally but it um, is through our Washington State Department of Licensing and there's a new updated list of all the different sort of health care providers that can are designated to allow you to change your your gender marker on your driver's license or ID it's been expanded it includes medical physicians internists endocrinologists gynecologists urologists osteopathic physicians psychiatrist, psychologist, Washington State licensed naturopathic physician, Washington, Washington State licensed advanced registered nurse practitioner, ARMP, Washington State licensed physician's assistant, PAs, and Washington State licensed certified osteopathic physician assistants. So that's pretty awesome. It's been pretty widely expanded. So we'll also post a link to that. That's GenderCast episode 37, performance series number two check-ins wrapping up. Hope to see you in Philly and Hope you're all venturing into a really awesome summer, and you'll hear again from us later on in June. Thanks. Copyright 2013, Gendercast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcast content and information related to these podcasts are the property of Gendercast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact gendercast at gmail.com for written permission. Oh,